Late in the day, I know. People are getting restless. Uh, so, uh, my name's Andrew Soa. I've been doing a lot of <laughs> been doing a lot of KiCad work uh, for, for about the past three years, and um, most notably, uh, people people know me for my PCB arts uh, stuff. So, I've been taking um, taking pictures and then. It, Putting that into KiCad and making, um, you know, different interesting shapes and things like that, and because, because I had to make weird, obscure shapes all the time, um, I also apply that to functional boards that I've made. So, <clears throat> kind of where I, where I started with all this is when I first started using KiCad, um, I wanted to do. Uh, a reverse mounted LED uh, display. So what I needed to do, I needed to cut out a, a hole in the board and I wanted it to move as it moved around the footprint. But KiCad doesn't do that. Uh, you know, there's no menu to do that, but when you look at the, uh, when you look at the files, the footprint, uh, you notice that there is, um, everything is human readable. So it has all the commands in the text file that you could just read and look at. So I decided, you know, what if I changed uh, the front side copper uh, layer in, in the text file uh, to edge cut and reloaded it and then it, it decided to work. Um, so that's kind of where I, I, I frame all this is that um, thinking of how to, to use more of the software by uh, manip manipulating the text files uh, to get it to do things that it doesn't want to do and it's not supposed to do, but it, it happens to work. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, using something else to make your board outlines. Um, square boards are really easy. You could snap to a grid, but KiCad doesn't have any complex snaps for arcs, circles, uh, things like that. Um, so if you want to do stuff like this where you have uh, half a mounting hole, um, space equally around a circle uh, and different arcs uh, touching other arcs, it gets really complicated to do uh, in KiCad itself, but um, you could solve that by designing those complex shapes in other software and then importing them into KiCad. Um, so what I, what I use is Fusion 360, but you could use um, Inkscape, Illustrator, anything, you know, any other um, program that could create DXF files. Uh, it's pretty standard uh, vector-based file format. Um, so in uh, Fusion 360, uh, basically you make uh, a sketch. So a sketch is a, a 2D drawing. Um, and here is the, there's the sketch for the bore on the right. Um, so I was able to define all my radiuses for my whole sizes um, and space everything exactly where I needed to space it. Um, and I have the parametric modeling of Fusion, um, all the c constraints uh, system, and I could snap everything together um, without having to worry about the odd um, arc system in KiCad. So once you, once you do your sketch, if you right click on the sketch in the left hand panel, uh, you save it as a DXF. And then once you save it as a DXF, you could then uh, import it back into KiCad. So um, in the file menu there, you have uh, import DXF file. Um, so what that does is it takes that vector file and then uh, adds it into uh, your board. Um, so you could, you could do this with uh, more than board outlines, but it, I find it, you know, the most convenient thing I have is to do the board outlines. Um, so this right here is KiCad 5.0 and KiCad 4.0, I think I had some issues with uh, the line width being really weird importing. Um, so on the picture on the bottom here, I have uh, a few different uh, line widths for the edge cuts. Um, so your, your board manufacturer is just going to read the center line of that and cut out there. Um, so it's important to make sure that is relatively small or you may think that, um, you know, you visually you may, you know, think that your board is going to be a little off. Um, so to fix that, you could, in 5.0, you have that default line width section um, in the import parameters on the top right there. Um, so you could 
uh, import at a specific size, um, but if you don't um, if you don't have that, or it doesn't come up. You're having problems with it. Um, going back to manipulating the text files to get it to do what you want to do. Um, what that shape looks like is uh, this in text format. So it's a little dense to read, uh, but basically there's GR lines and GR arcs. So those are uh, your different arcs and lines. Um, but over lay over here it says edge cut, and then the any text editor. Uh, change the width there and the layer, and you could you know change all that um, and get it back to where you want to be. Um, uh, DXF file, or this is um, this is the board file. Um, so, yes, yeah, sorry, that is. Um, so if you just if you just open kicad.pcb, uh, you'll get um, all that information there. So yeah, if you if you want to see how things are structured, I usually just drop I'll drop random files into Notepad and um, just kind of view how they parse and how they set up their their data structure, uh, and it you know it could help you understand what's going on uh, with the program. So the biggest problem uh, I have with arcs is uh, basically KiCad does an arc a very odd way. So you have a center a start and an angle. Um, so in, in the arc property sections, you have a center x, y, so that's the center of the arc, and then you um, have a start point x, y, so that defines, so the center's here and the start point's somewhere over here, so that's your radius, and then the arc angle is how far that moves from that point. So it's very confusing and very unintuitive to usually how you think about arcs. Um, so that's why you, you, know, you should do it, probably should do it in another program, uh, but because of it doesn't define it the same way um, as Fusion defines it, you sometimes get these little tiny uh, misalignments because it's trying to like intersect two arcs with each other and the computer or the program freaks out and, and doesn't, doesn't do it perfectly. There's some rounding errors. Um, so unfortunately, the only way I could find out how to get around this is to actually draw little tiny lines in between the arcs. Um, it's a huge pain in the butt, but um, there's the way to do it. It's not it's not necessarily easy. Is on the bottom right of um, on the bottom right of KiCad, you'll get this coordinate information, um, and if you hit spacebar, you could set that as a new reference. Um, so if I hit spacebar, uh, this down here will go to zero zero. Um, so what you need to do uh, is you need to hover over the uh, you could snap to these points here um, and uh, zero out there, um, and then oh sorry, no. Uh, so you need to snap there and you need to get the uh, coordinates. Um, so once you have that coordinates, you could use uh, the x, y of those two snap points and you could draw a little line to it. Um, so that line ends up being like, um, you know, eight decimal places long. Um, so you, like, you just have to basically take out a notepad, write stuff down, uh, and then manually enter it. Um, and the other thing you have to do is you have to make sure you do it in millimeters because the software does all its calculation in millimeters. So if you do it in inches, you don't get enough accuracy to actually connect it. Um, so yeah, so you have to find the center points of those, those arcs right there, and you have to manually draw a little line. Uh, and to find those, those center points, you have to look down here at the coordinate system. So that's you know, something they sh could fix, but uh, you know, open source stuff, it, there, it takes a while. But, um, so that's the, mi you need to fix that to then um, do cool stuff like export step files. Uh, sometimes your 3D viewer will crash if you don't do this. Um, so if you're ever getting problems with complex arcs and curves and the step export doesn't work and the 3D viewer doesn't work, you probably have missing segments there that aren't completely connected. So you have to go around the board and try to find those. So very tedious, um, but 
there's a solution to it. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, new in, in KiCad 5.0, you could do arbitrary paths. Um, so before you're, you could only do rectangles, circles, things like that. Uh, but now you could actually inject your own geometry into pads. Um, so I found this out answering a question uh, for the hack chat I did. Um, so you, know, you could, the good thing about that is that um, previously the DRC wouldn't work um, when you did these crazy complex shapes. Uh, but now with the arbitrary pad uh, system, the DRC st will still work and you could get, um, you could get, assign a net name to it and, and route it like a typical pad. Um, it's still, it is buggy, it's not completely done and they're uh, working on it right now. Um, so 5.0 5 is not stable yet, um, but it's, it's definitely way better than the, the, the other way I used to do it. Um, so generally like a breakdown of the beginning of the process is KiCad ha has this bitmap to uh, footprint converter. So basically you import uh, a bitmap or PNG or anything um, and then it tries to read the shape and then uh, put it in a form that the, it's pro the program can read. Um, it's not uh, perfect, um, but that's, that's what I use to do most of my boards. There's some other programs out there that um, people have made to try to uh, do it directly from SVGs and things like that, um, but this works for most of what I need to do. Um, let's see. So the one problem you have with this, I mean, this is a low quality image, but um, depending on your threshold, you could really drastically change the shape. Um, so uh, starting with a high res file and you know, black and white files is the, is the best way to get um, crisp results with this. Um, so what, you know, I'll usually, for all my art stuff, I'll render it out in colors and then break everything down to black and white export it in um, high resolution and then uh, bring it in here. Um, so, ba so what this program does is it takes that image there and then um, then it turns it into this. So those, uh, the bottom section here is the FP poly. Um, so that is basically taking the geometry of that image and putting in something Kai Kai could read. Um, so what, what I learned about, what I learned about this is you could take that geometry and apply it to multiple other things um, and it works in a couple different situations. Um, so to do, you know, artboards, what I do is I change uh, that layer uh, down there and I manually edit the layers. Um, because the import tool, down here you see the import tool only has silk screen and uh, solder mask, but if you change that, uh, you can change that to copper, paste layer. Um, so I'd, you know, previously I would have to manually change um, this layer um, to, to build up the board. Um, um, and then, you know, I usually do that with um, replace all type functions, so uh, you could find, you just export everything as uh, the silk um, and then replace it with um, whatever layer you want, um, just in whatever t text setter you like to use. Um, so the, let's see. So now with the arbitrary pad, um, tool. Uh, this is this is what it looks like. So you could go up uh, into the top left over there by shape, and you could put a uh, custom rectangle. And then uh, basically how I figured this out is I just generated uh, one of those files. So I generated um, just one pad, and just to see how it how it processed that information. Um, so when you do that. Um, it comes in this format. Um, so up on top you have uh, the pad, which is pad number one. Uh, it's position, 
uh, the different layers associated with it. Uh, but the main thing is that looking at it is the same, um, it's a different poly uh, name, but it's the same type of structure with the x, y coordinates. Um, so what I did is I took the coordinates from um, the footprint generator, put these um, back in in the, in the text file, um, and then what happened is then it loads uh, back into uh, the pad, um, the pad configurator like this. So it, uh, it took the Hackaday logo, um, took the, the points for the skull, and loaded it back in here. Um, so what's nice about this is uh, you have access to all your uh, layers. So if you want to put it on the silk screen, uh, solder mask, uh, it's just a checkbox at this point. Um, so that makes it a little easier. Uh, there's other functions they added in where you could scale and rotate. Um, so if you, um, you know, if you weren't super precise with your, uh, with your size, you could scale um, nicely and not have to uh, do it the complex way. Um, so, uh, you know, that's kind of the basic process of um, making the, the custom shapes in, uh, with the new arbitrary footprint editor. So uh, what you do, um, you know, use the bitmap converter tool. It'll give you all these different co uh, coordinate system points. You copy and replace that into uh, a new footprint file, and then you'll be able to load it, uh, save it in the usual manner, save footprints. Um, so the, back to kind of what got me started with manipulating these text files is uh, another thing you could do is um, add, add cutouts to footprints. Um, so, um, let's see. So what you could do is um, you could add edge cuts, I internal edge cuts into the footprint and create cutouts for uh, different connectors, different type of reverse mount LEDs, or just, you know, if you want to do, you know, something um, non-technical. Um, so um, basically how you do that. Uh, no, it's, it's, it just acts like an edge cut, so it'll be an internal, it'll route out. Um, so, let's see. Next. So over here, um, you know, you could add a graphical line to your footprints. Um, but basically all you need to do is, once you add that graphical line, um, you could add it in this, the sales screen layer where you want it to go, and then if you go back into the text file, you'll see uh, a place with a line, and then it'll say, uh, you know, f dot silk s. So you could just change that in the text file to any one of these layers, and then it'll change it in the footprint. Um, so you could, I mean, if you wanted to do, you could do, uh, you know, different fabrication lines and, or, uh, you, know, you know, notes and, and designators, things like that. Um, and it'll accept it as, as something that works fine. And then um, when you go back and load it into your board, it'll just act like you put it there uh, any other way. So here um, is the footprint I made with the Hackaday logo. Uh, I can move it around. Uh, it has a net associated, so you get a rat's, uh, the rat's nest shows up. Um, you could connect. Um, circuits to the custom shape, um, and um, you know the program knows how to handle that. Um, if I do, if I update my fill zone, um, it fills fills around, so I can move this, and then um, and then the other thing is it. Um, it's a little hard to see here, but it also moves. Uh, oops. Oops. 
Hmm. All right, that's a problem. Oh, this shifted. Second. Um, so, oh, come on. All right, so um, you could see here in the eye, it has the cutout. Um, and then typically you would have to draw that uh, with the line tool in the board editor. But when you embed it in the footprint, you could move this around and then redo the 3D uh, render, and then all those lines move um, and update automatically um, into the board. So, um, you know, it saves you a lot of pain of, you know, having to redraw um, your, board, your board lines. Um, uh, so, I know Oshpark is a little uh, weird with inside cutouts. Um, if it's on the edge cut layer and in the middle of the board, they should register it. Um, a lot of it's probably good to add um, some type of text inside that says this is a cutout point. Um, so what people would do, it co common is, um, since I want that eye cut out, I'll just do some type of text layer on a, a text on like a fabrication layer and just say, or, um, and just, you know, say cut out, um, just so whoever's looking at that, looking at that at the, uh, the board house uh, knows that's the area you, you want to remove. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if, if it's not an automated service, you could talk to them and, and kind of tell them um, and let them know um, to make sure they route that. But I usually, it usually comes out, uh, successful when I've done it. Um, so the other, the other thing you could do with this method is um, you could do custom fill zones. So uh, basically uh, what's nice about the fill zone is it automatically regenerates um, as you move parts around. Um, so, you know, the, ma the main thing that, that it came for me is, is when I was doing um, uh, this board right here. So um, the problem I had was I wanted to run uh, five volts um, around this whole edge here. Um, but it's hard, you know, KiCad doesn't want to do arced uh, lines. Um, so you can't do an arc trace um, or you can't do it easily. Um, so I would have to like make tiny little lines, um, and that's kind of a pain. Um, and then as I moved this around, I'd have to, you know, if I made any changes, I have to um, change all that. So what I did is I actually made a, a fill zone on this whole outside here. Um, so basically, I drew out a ring um, that is the size of that that circle. Um, used the bitmap converter, got all the the point for that, and then um, imported it back as a fill zone in, in the text file. Um, and that allowed me to make, um, I'll make a ring that is my power rail, but then it's also a fill zone that adapts to um, as I move parts around. So here's a little, little busy, but um, so basically right here is um, the fill zone, so the screw hole here, I have a uh, keep out, so um, it'll, it'll cut this circle here by itself, so I don't have any issues with shorting a uh, screw on the, on the power plane. Uh, and then also uh, the signal wire here, it did this nice little cutout. Um, um, so I didn't have to, um, you know, manually do that. So, uh, Uh, let's see. So 
So yeah, you know, how you would do that is um, you would find um, the zone uh, in your board file, so that kicad.pcb, um, you know, you would look for, you know, it should be pretty obvious to see if you look at the different designators up here, um, and you'll see, uh, if it's just a square, you'll see like four of these points. Um, so basically the same thing, you take all these um, points that it generated, add that in, and then reload your board, um, and then it'll update with that, uh, with that fill zone. Um, so, Yeah, so you'll set, um, so if I go into here. So you could set your clearances, um, how it'll do thermal, uh, thermal release. So you, um, you can either have it solid around the pad or have um, short traces. So it, it makes, uh, you don't have to worry about some solder problems with uh, cold joints. Um, Uh, overlapping, you, it, it will overlap the same, oh, you, you can set a priority level, um, so you have two different, um, let's see here. Um, so this is the priority level, so you have two different ones and you want one to be, uh, take over the other one, um, I believe higher is better, I could have the reverse though, but you could, it'll be easily noticeable, um, and then, but the one problem I usually have is like the corners, um, if, if you want to do like multiple shapes of one of the same net, um, if you try to do like a square within a square, there's usually like a rounded corner that um, it's like a like a little aberration that happens. So there'll be like um, as one square goes to the other, the the corners will just be nothing, uh, which is kind of annoying. Um, but you could get around that if you get around that if you do this complex shape way. But that you know that takes a lot of time. So. Um, I usually just live with it, um, but so if I move my LED here, uh, redraw, um, so it'll update and remove stuff here. So um, you know, I don't know all the applications, but you know, it's just thinking, change your way of thinking to think that I could make whatever shape. Uh, lets you do some interesting things. Um, and then um, some other applications for this are um, antenna design, uh, different RF, uh, high frequency RF, stu RF stuff. I don't do high frequency RF, but I know that uh, there's a lot of uh, precise shapes for different um, filter circuits and antennas. Um, so what you could do is you could um, design that a, as a picture, or if you have a, a program that puts it as a picture, um, c use the bitmap converter, get the shapes, put that into a footprint, um, and then you have a, um, then you have a footprint that uh, follows the RC that you could integrate in your circuit. You, so you could put a schematic symbol to it um, and build into your schematic and then um, set pads and things like that. Um, and then if you wanna put solder mat, uh, you know, if you don't wanna expose, you could take off the mass, you could uh, change to copper on both sides and things like that. Um, and it gives you all those tools of making uh, pads. Um, so, um, you know, that's what, um, that's what this board looked like at the end. Uh, this is a, a neo pixel indicator ring with a magnet, magnetic encoder in the center that I made for someone for a scar arm. Um, so you wanted to have some status lights on that and uh, use uh, that encoder for uh, positional feedback. Um, so that's all I have. Uh, I was assuming there was gonna be a lot of, you know, good amount of questions because. Um, so if you have any questions, I... I don't know, if no questions, we could end it a little early, but...
Um, so your, the quality of your silk screen, uh, one of it is what process they use. Um, so um, some processes have a lower DPI resolution than others. Um, so some are printed on and some are silk screen. Um, I don't, I forgot which one's better. Drew may be able to answer that, but I know Oshpark, if you do the quick service, they have a lower resolution. Um, the regular service, they have like 1,000 DPI, I think is the resolution. Um, but it's, it's basically whoever manufactures the board is really gonna um, designate the quality of that uh, silk screen. Um, you know, how carefully they apply it, things like that. Um, if it's something you do, uh, if you have, you know, could talk to some of the employees, they may be able to recommend um, some strategies, or they may just, you made it, they just may flag it, say like, be a little careful with this, because it matters on this one. Um, but, you know, that's all up to the process that your uh, manufacturer uses, and just how, um, you know, how clean they keep their facilities, and the person applying it. So, yeah, I know. Yeah, the yeah, I know the Arduino did the multiple color solder mask trick. Um, yeah, cause, I mean, some of the, the premise for a lot of this is that you have, you basically have a. A, d a process that um, you pay for the square inch, and you could kind of, you have a sandbox to do whatever you can, you want inside that. Um, so it's, well, you know, some of this is just free when you order stuff, um, and it's inherently high resolution because it has to be extremely accurate um, to do circuits. So um, you basically get an extremely accurate uh, high resolution um, silk screening process, and and you know, thinking it that way. Uh, you know, kind of is how I thought about doing all this weird shapes and things like that. Which one? Oh, I haven't seen that one. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, so. Brian Benchoff did uh, yeah, a two-color Tindy, um, Tindy PCB. So, I mean, the other thing is that if you order anything at scale, like it's it's completely custom. You know, everything's custom. So you're making a custom shape. You have a custom stack up. So you could say, you know, um, you could kind of talk to people and get them to do uh, whatever you need them to do. Yeah, so I mean, part, a lot of this is working around what the GUI provides to you. Um, so I, in an ideal world, I could tell, you know, I, I don't know how to program C to the level to do this, um, but I could tell the developers, say, hey, could you add these features, and it gets put in, but, you know, that's could, you know, I have to convince someone to do it, it's someone else's time, and it may be a two-year process for that to happen. So this is kind of, you know, a lot of this came out I want to do this right now, how do I figure it out? And it takes a little more time and it's, you know, kind of messy and includes, but, um, you know, it, it works and I was able to get, you know, I, I got what I wanted in the end uh, and sometimes you have to do kind of these funky things to get there. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, coils in boards, do you have any good tips? Co Um, so, I mean, if it just, if it's a high resolution image, you could uh, do that, but probably like one of those SVG converters, there's like SVG2 mod on GitHub, and I know someone else uh, is working on another one, 
Um, so if you look up uh, CACAD SVG uh, converters, uh, there's like two or three out there. Um, so that may work better to go directly from the SVG to that because uh, it's a pretty simple shape. Um, the main problem I had with the ones I use is when I do uh, like very complex SVG files, it ends up crashing them. Um, they just can't. It's like it's they're mostly Python based, and they, they, I don't know what's what's failing, but they they can't handle um, the amount of stuff I put at it. Um, so that's why I I you know part of my process was I was doing extremely complicated stuff, um, and the other tools available weren't weren't able to handle it. Uh, so the bitmap converter handles like the photo, like fo uh, the photo renders I do better, um, because it's a lot. You know, it's not just like a smooth arc. Or, um, it's a lot of weird jagged shapes that come out. Um, but if you have if if you have something that's uh, you know like lettering and things like that, uh, you could possibly get better results with uh, one of those SVG uh, Python scripts. Um, so yeah, I would just recommend trying a couple different things. Um, you know, I use CACAD because that's kind of what I know, but uh, there's other, um, I need to get, try Eagle a little more and, um, you know, see how, how that works. Uh, does CACAD support true type fonts? What's that? The true type fonts? True uh, I don't know how to change fonts. Yeah. Next to this cool graphic, and then use their font rendering engine to bring in the graphic. I yeah. Too, and that's what we've done. Um, I don't think you could change the font, but I haven't tried to, you know, circumvent that uh, system. There's definitely not like a GUI uh, option to do that, but um, I mean that's. I think that's another thing that has to get figured out because uh, you know, it's. The other, th you know, it would be nice to have different styles of font, and to do it, we have to like make an image and convert it down, and do this, you know, fairly manual process. Um, you yeah, know, it would take a lot of time. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Unfortunately, that's not in there, but it would be nice if they could add it. With the with the custom fills, I remember you talking before about was it a crosshatch or something like that that you were trying? Oh yes. Yeah. So one problem, I, yeah. So. Uh, I was messing around with capacitive touch stuff, and some, uh, you know, some things want like cross hatching ground planes to not interfere with it. Um, so there's no cross. I, I think Altium has cross hatching ground planes. Uh, KiCad doesn't. Um, so you could do that. Uh, you know, if you make an image, make an image of your whole board, um, and then just place, you know, do do the system to make a, you know, a cross. Take a cross hatching image, make it bigger than your board that you need, and you can just make it square, and then you just put stuff in there, and it'll, uh, the program will take it away. I don't know if that made sense, but I know uh, Bullport kind of did something similar where they had a bunch of zeros and ones in their uh, binary counter, and then um, that was kind of just ingrained into the, uh, the backdrop, and then as they stu put stuff in, um, it would cut away. Yes. So some of the, I, um, I've written some of this up. I need to write some more of this up. Um, you know, doing this in talk presentation is a little hard. Uh, but I, I will be doing uh, further write-ups on like specifically going through so tutorial style. Uh, if you know, if you want, if you're having, you know, if you didn't follow this completely um, or you get stuck, 
Um, and I'm also doing a workshop tomorrow um, where we're going to you know, bring whatever picture you want, and then we'll go through the process of rendering down that picture uh, and creating it into a, a CACAD board. Um, so if you want some more hands on stuff, uh, tomorrow at 10 I'm going to be doing that. Um, so you know, bring a laptop, uh, Inkscape, CACAD, uh, and whatever picture you want to do, and we could work on that. Uh, either four or five is fine. It doesn't. Uh, I could. We could do it in both. Um, it's just um, the icons are a little, little different, but for the non-functional stuff, it's it's pretty much the same process. Are there features in five that you're excited about? Oh, so yeah, uh, KiCad five is definitely really nice. I've been using it for a year, year and a half. Um, so far, uh, and I've mainly been using because it has step export. So uh, you could take, um, I've been doing projects where I've been working with mechanical engineers. Um, so basically, you could take a board like this, as long as you have all the step files, um, it'll export um, you know, all your outlines and, and things like that in a step file format. And you could give it to your mechanical engineer, and they could build enclosures around it, make sure there's no um, fit uh, issues or things like that. Um, or if you're the mechanical engineer, um, you can import whatever CAD tool you want, and it's a little easier to uh, do enclosures and stuff like that. Uh, but that's the main feature. Some other things is um, they fixed the problem where like you could run traces off of edge cuts, um, so you could basically run traces off your board. So I'd have to like put up dummy guard traces, uh, so my DR, so I wouldn't like get too close to the edge. Uh, so there's a lot of like quality of life improvements like that. Um, I've heard they're trying to redo the whole arc system. Um, I don't know when that's going to get finished, but uh, that the arc system, it's, it's bad and it's, uh, it needs to, it should support splines and things like that. Um, so I, there's talk about that. I don't know the timeline if, or you know, when or if that's going to get finished. Um, but yeah, step export was the big thing I've been using for a long time. Um, if you're doing any collaborative project, it's a, it's a huge plus. All right, I think that's it. <laughs>